Well, hey guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, where I'm gonna start out this video with a fun fact. Do you happen to know what the most popular DIY topic is on YouTube these days? No, it's not make your own charcuterie cutting boards or do an epoxy river table. In fact, this category far exceeds those two topics combined because the most popular video topic on YouTube, near as I can tell these days, is drywall repair. Actually, because I'm a carpenter and not a statistician, I have no idea if that fun fact is true or not, but one thing I know for sure is there's a lot of videos on YouTube showing how to repair holes in drywall, and there's a lot of different methods and techniques, and this one is not totally unique to me because there's videos that talk about using a California patch for repairing small holes, but I'm going to put a next level twist on that technique and repair a rather large hole in the next level carpentry shop wall without the use of the common perforated paper tape or fiberglass tape. And the test case I have for demonstrating this technique is this rather large patch in the shop wall that was cut as access for a plumbing modification. And I need to get that patch because at some point I'm going to clean out the shop and give it a facelift with a fresh coat of paint. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to show you how I go about doing this patch, which as far as patches go, is a pretty large hole, and I'm gonna do it without tape because it makes the process quick, clean, and easy, eliminates steps, and the finished product is as seamless and invisible as you can get for a sheetrock patch. So I see it as a next level approach to a common task that's pretty popular. This is just a piece of half inch moisture resistant sheetrock that I used to plug the hole until I could get a scrap of the 5 8 for the actual patch. And I didn't shoot video of cutting the hole out because this was quite some time back. But this is what a normal patch would look like. Uh, just cut with a decent uh, small gap margin around the side and then that would be uh, pre-filled and taped. But I'm going to pop this out of here, talk about the opening and fit that piece to it. As you can see with that temporary patch removed, this is a floor truss. And when I cut the patch out or cut the hole out, I was careful to cut through the center of the framing members. So I'd have wood there for driving screws to hold the patch in place. If you look close, you can see that the edges are pretty clean. And I've beveled away the paper using a sheetrock knife like this. And if you have a sharp blade, you can just trim off that little fuzzy edge of paper and that'll make your patch a whole lot better when it's done because you're not taping over the irregular edges. But that's what the opening looks like. There's a couple divots here that blew out and I kind of wish I would have pre-filled those but I'm going to go ahead and do the patch just like this to show you it's possible even under slightly less than ideal conditions. For this method I want to cut the patch bigger by an inch and a quarter all the way around. But on this patch, because it's three sided, I'll just make it an inch and a quarter taller and two and a half inches wider. And I can do that by just burning two and a half inches over there. I come up with 18 and 5 eighths. And if I burn an inch and a quarter on the top, I end up with 23 and a quarter high. And because I'm not actively doing any drywall work, I just went to a big box store and bought a 24 inch square scrap for a little over a buck and I'll use that. But when I'm doing this patchwork, I always start by using a sureform rasp just to clean up the edges to get any nubs, or off, nubs off of there. Because those smooth edges just make it easier to work with. And then I use that sheetrock knife just to clean off that little nib of paper going around the edge just so I'm working with nice, clean, smooth edges. Next, I'll cut this piece to the size I just measured, which, if you remember, is 18 and 5 eighths. I'll cut the width first. And then I'll cut the height second. That's going to be a little tricky because this is 24 inches. I got a cut at 23 and a quarter. So it's just going to be a little cut on this side. And the best way to cut off a little piece like that is to make the same cut 
front and back, which is unusual for scoring. And generally, if you're working with scraps, you can get a bigger scrap and snap off a bigger piece. But after scoring the front and the back, I just uh, use the body of the knife to widen my grip and snap that little piece off of there. And that keeps it from coming off in little palm sized or uh, fist sized crumbles. And then I'll go ahead and clean up the edge. Like that. And then I'll use the knife to clean off that fuzzy edge of the paper. Just taking a shaving off there. And the extra step of cleaning up the edges like that really does make a difference when you're doing the final uh, mudding of this because the edge is clean. There's not a little flared edge that you have to tape over, which makes a bigger hump in the patch. But now that the piece is cut to 23 and a quarter by 18 and 5 eighths, I just flip it over and make a couple more cuts. And this step is basically the crux of the whole video. If I was doing a YouTube short, this is the main part you'd be watching. I'm just going to trim this paper off the back here so it's nice and clean. And now I'm ready for those cuts. And as a reminder, because this is a three-sided patch, I'm not going to score the back on the bottom of the piece because it just maintains that cut edge. But I sketch pencil marks in there an inch and a quarter from the edges. But now I'll score those with a knife. Just hooking my thumb on the end of the tape, putting the point of the knife on that pencil line, and scoring it, and then double scoring it with the knife alone. And of course, if you're not comfortable using the tape and knife technique, you can also use a sheet rock square or some other straight edge to line up those marks and just score along that straight edge. And I'll emphasize it's important to double score the back to get a nice clean break in this next step. This is the most important step of the whole process. So I'm just going to clamp this down. So that I can show you what this looks like. If I wasn't shooting video, I could just do this on my across my knees, but here we go. I'm just gonna snap this piece on the edge here. This is 5-8 sheet rock, so it's a pretty tough bend. You can hear it going. I'll score it again because it's extra tough with this camera angle. I can't get the leverage on it. That should help. So once you pull this off, the trick is to pull the gypsum off the paper by pulling up and back like this. And leaving just that paper behind. I can use a sure form plane to take any little nubs off of here. But I don't want to pull the paper loose from the front of the scrap. Because this is 5-8 sheetrock, I'm double and triple scoring everything to get that great clean. If this was half inch uh, drywall, this would be a whole lot easier. But the trick is to snap it loose and then pull this piece up and back off the paper. Naturally, the bigger the patch, the tougher this little step is to do, but you can see the result. And I shave those little nibs off of there so that they don't crumble as I go to put this piece in place. And while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and shave that paper a little bit. 
just like that. I'm using a low angle on the knife. I'm kind of using my thumb to guide it so I get a nice even cut. Might as well do the end while I'm at it. And what that does is just keep that little bit of paper from bunching up uh, on the stud, etc. So this patch will fit nice and clean and flat. And here again, I'm clamping the piece down and then scoring and rescoring along the line to make it easier to break away the gypsum on the back from the paper on the front. And once again, pulling up and back to remove the gypsum from the paper so that it doesn't delaminate at the front. And then finish preparing the piece by cutting away the fuzzy paper backer on the edge. And if everything goes like it's supposed to, I end up with a finished patch It basically has pre-taped edges. And the piece of sheetrock on the back here is the actual size of the opening, which is 16 by 21 and 5 eighths. And you can see in this shot how the piece I already had in that hole lays right on top here, and the edges match up all the way around. So let's see how I did. And this is going to be a little bit tricky to show, but this is how the piece needs to fit. You can see that it just fits in there, between there, side to side, a little bit of play. Don't want it too tight. And when it's pushed into place, the paper uh, covers the gap all the way around without adding a separate piece of tape. So that right there is a win. Once the patch is all made and pre-fit, it's time to get a little messy for the most important part of the patch. So let's see what we got in this bucket. That's not too bad. Sometimes uh, you need to add a little water and give it a little mix to get a good consistency. But this, this is a fresh bucket, feels pretty good. So I'm just going to go with this. And this is going to be a little tricky to show with a single camera angle there, but I'm going to apply some mud to the hole first because this has moisture in it and it's going to start softening the paper on that patch right away. So I don't want that to happen while I'm doing this. Uh, another complication is here. I got a couple big divots when I was cutting this piece out and uh, ideally I would have pre-filled these and let them dry before I got to this stage, but uh, I didn't do that. So here we are and I'm just going to pack them full now. And the biggest uh, drawback of that is that it'll take that extra long to dry. But I'm just uh, making sure I get that mud put in there. And just using uh, this awesome level five putty knife, taping knife to put a flare of mud around the edge like this. And I'm just getting it right out of the bucket. I'm not using a taping hock for this or a taping pan. Getting a good application of uh, taping mud in there so that the gap between the patch and the drywall is filled. That's important. Just kind of put it in there like at about a 45 degree angle. And if you're doing a bunch of patches like this, it's much better to put the mud in a, in a tray or on a hawk and do this. But as it is, I'm just going to kind of wing it here for a one-off patch. And notice I'm pushing this mud onto that dry, crum crumbly sheetrock divot there. Just kind of work it in and make sure it's really sticking and it'll soak up any of the loose uh, crumbles of gypsum that are there. I want to make sure the spot on the top is good and full. I don't want any of that insulation in between the wood and the back of the patch. And that's kind of messy, but it's as good as it needs to look. As long as that edge is thoroughly covered and there's some extra in there for squeeze out. And now I'm going to pre-mud the back of the patch. And I've got it laying on a flat surface here so that I can go around. And give this a little bit of mud there on the edge of the sheetrock so that that joint is full and then I'll make sure that it's applied to the back of the paper itself like this. 
there's going to be a whole lot of squeezing going on when I put this piece in place. So the main uh, goal here is to make sure that all these surfaces have uh, fresh mud on them. Hope you can see this good enough in the camera. I'm working quickly because that paper starts to soften up very, very quick. And if it gets too soft, it can be a problem. And this again is one of the challenges of doing larger patches with this technique. When you're doing a six inch square patch, this is a whole lot uh, less critical. But on this big piece, essentially 18 by 24, it gets to be a little bigger of a deal, but I do want to show that this is possible. I'm just making sure that that paper's got a layer on it everywhere. So there's no dry spots when I go to put this in place. Now it's showtime. And here we go. I got my little time capsule signed on the back there. I'm just going to put this guy in place. Carefully slip it in there. Just kind of work it in there. This is just going to push the extra mud out the front. Push it in the back, you know, whatever voids are back there. I just want to make sure that it's all the way in. I'm actually going to slip it out because I got a little too much mud in the bottom and the back. You got a little carried away there, but that's all right. I'm just going to scoop some of this out of here. Make sure we still got enough there. And this kind of varies from job to job. There's some irregularities in the framing here. In between these truss plates that you can hardly see. So I actually need a little shimming action from this mud. I just want to make sure that that'll go in far enough. That's sitting really well all except for right here. It goes a little tricky to show in a video. But once that's done, I'm going to run a few screws in here. And those screws are actually pushing it in a little too far on the top. I can back the screws out. Just let that mud cushion float this about where it needs to be. And if anything, I want it to be too far in, not too far out. Once it's screwed into place, I can just go about getting this mud out of here. A little tear in that paper on that top part, but that's all right. Work that mud out from behind. And I'm kind of contaminating this mud bucket with little bits of tape and stuff that's coming off these edges. And that's kind of a no no, but it's the way it's going to look in this video. You can see this pocket here, that's where I didn't pre fill. in that paper there a little bit. And once I've got this all laid in there, excess mud pulled out from behind that tape, so once everything's set in place and I'm happy with how that patch is laying in there, then I'll just switch to a wider knife. 
and give this another coat over the top. So in effect, I'm bedding, I'm installing the patch, bedding, and skimming the tape all in one, uh, all at one time, rather than installing the patch, pre-filling, applying the tape, bedding the tape, and then coating the tape in separate steps. And I got all these little hitchhikers in here because I wasn't segregating the mud that I used, but that's okay. Well, I guess that's about enough fussing and fiddling with this patch. And obviously, if I did this all day, every day, I could have made that go a lot more smoothly without having to remove the patch because I would be able to gauge how much mud to put on the edges, etc. But I'm leaving it in the video because I just want to show you that this is possible. Those are some of the factors you're going to uh, encounter if you ever try to do a patch like this, uh, especially one of this size. The other thing is, um, a smarter guy probably would have chosen a test case where instead of the patch being down here on the floor where I got a bad camera angle and I got to kneel down, I could have just done one up in the middle of the wall and the whole thing would have um, resulted in a much more professionally produced video. But there it is. And at this stage, I'm basically three steps ahead. The patch is in, uh, the tape is, or it's pre-filled, the tape is bedded, and the tape is first coated. And also because I'm using the paper that's on the sheet itself, I don't have that additional thickness of the perforated tape or the fiberglass tape going around here to mud over. So uh, once this dries, I'll put a fan on it to dry those uh, deep pockets there. But once that's done, all this will take is a light sanding and then a wide skim coat with a wide knife to finish off the patch. So I'm going to go clean up the tools and cool off, get a fan going here, and I'll come back once this is dry enough to lightly sand and finish coat. After running that fan on medium for four or five hours, this patch is thoroughly dry. Uh, if you look close, you can see there's shrinkage down here in that big pocket. Uh, but that's all dried up nice. Everything is bone white and ready to sand. One thing I wanted to mention uh, that I didn't talk about while I was putting the mud on there is that you can use a straight edge of some sort when you're applying the mud to figure out how big of a hump there is. You can just see if the panel's all in alignment and I could just tell with my hand, but when I used screws to uh, pull this in or pull it out, if you can't tell by feel what you got going on, you can use a straight edge and it'll highlight any differences in the plane in the wall. And now that the mud is dry, you can see that this stick rocks just a little bit. It's really nice and flat. There's hardly any space behind the stick there. A little hump on this side, which is pretty normal. And that's a very small amount. Generally with regular tape, that, that hump is much bigger and needs to be feathered out over a wider area. But you can see tracks here from my straight edge when I was checking this out while that mud was still wet. And this is barely a sixteenth of an inch of a hump in there that needs to be averaged out when I apply the next coat of mud after I sand this. Another thing I neglected to mention is about preparing the wall before the patch goes in. In this case, this is just a flat finish wall. All there is on here is roller stipple. There's no knockdown or splatter texture. But regardless, uh, before putting the patch in, I always take a sharpened putty knife and scrape the wall and take all the nibs down off of any kind of texture that's on there. Because I don't want to put the paper from the patch over any of those nubs because that just makes a bigger hump, just requires a bigger hump uh, to cover up the patch afterwards. And with that said, I always start the sanding step using that same sharpened putty knife and that just removes any nibs or ridges in that coat of taping mud on there. It's just quicker and easier than with the sander. And 
and that's all in really good shape and looking just like it should at this stage of the game. So now I can get into the sanding step and I'm just using this Gator sanding block. It's kind of, it's a foam block and I've got 120 grit paper on here. You can use all manner of sanding blocks or sanding sponges for this. I like this pad because it's got a little flex to it. It's large and the 120 grit uh, paper really cuts fast and because this is nice and dry it's not going to clog the paper. But the goal at this point is to feather all the edges. I don't want any sharp edges that are left behind from the mud knife when I was applying this. And my goal here is to remove absolutely as much of that taping compound as I can until the paper starts showing through. Then I know that the hump that covers the seam is a bare minimum of thickness that makes for a smoother, less visible patch in the end. But I do want to stop when I get down to the paper because I don't want to sand through that. And it all goes pretty quick and easy and doesn't take long at all to remove those little edges from the taping mud. And sometimes I use a circular motion Kind of whatever it takes to really get through that taping compound and make a nice smooth patch. I reset the camera angle there and I'm just going to use a flashlight to shine across here and hopefully that will highlight the sanding process as I'm doing it. And you can see the ridges down here from the knife and from shrinkage on the patch and you should be able to see how fast this removes it. And at that point you can see the paper starting to show through here, but I've removed all the unfeathered edges. So the next coat will go on nice and thin and smooth. And that glancing light really magnifies the ridges that I need to sand out of this patch because without that light you can't even tell these are there. So you know that this is applying a lot more scrutiny than is necessary for a good patch. But it does make it possible to get a level 5 finish in pretty short order. There's an obvious low spot where that divot was, a couple of high spots where the paper shows through, and a few random scratches. But those are very shallow and take little or nothing to smooth out and fill in. And that's pretty much all it takes with this patch looking just like it needs to at this stage of the game. So I can brush off the dust and apply a finished coat of mud to the patch. And as fate would have it, my shop vac is out on the job site. So I'm just using a bench brush to remove dust from the surface before applying that next coat of mud. For this last coat, I've switched to a mud tray and a 10 inch level five knife. This is a beauty. Could use the 12, 12 inch knife here, but this is a 10. And I'm just gonna give this a nice skim coat of mud with a little bit of hump over that joint. And keep in mind, I'm not really trying to give a lesson on applying mud like a professional. There's plenty of videos out there, but this is just what it looks like on a tapeless patch like this. First, I kind of go over the whole patch with more or less a skim coat, leaving plenty of mud on there so that the knife will travel flat and smooth over the patch area as I wipe down the edges and give the whole patch a nice, consistent, smooth, even coat. And that should just about do it. I'm a little bit fussy with this and I don't do this all day every day so it takes me a little while to get the nice smooth finish I'm after. But with the mud thinned out a little bit and a nice clean wide knife, applying pressure to the sheetrock and flaring away onto the mud, after just a few minutes it can get a nice smooth even finish for that. And I can put the fan on it to get this thin coat to dry off. But first, I'll use a glancing light to show what this coat really looks like. And you can see a little bit of chatter marks from the knife and a few lines. But any ridges will sand off in a flash and any streaks or divots will fill in just as easily after this coat is dry. I'm going to jump in here for a minute while that mud's drying and ask that you'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. If you like in-depth content like this, off in the weeds on a common topic, uh, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button while you're at it. Let those folks over there at YouTube know there's things happening here at Next Level Carpentry. And I'm not going to talk the whole time the mud's drying, but uh, make sure you check out links in the video description uh, where you can get t-shirts and swag from the Next Level Carpentry shop, a link to tools and supplies seen in this and other videos, and assorted items. And the last thing I want to add to this intermission is a special shout out to all the patrons of Next Level Carpentry on Patreon. 
If you've watched other Next Level Carpentry videos in the past, you may notice that the video image clarity is noticeably better in this particular video, and that's because I'm using a brand new camera that I got to upgrade from the 1080p I've been using for since the beginning of the channel, and this one is able to shoot 4K video, and the camera purchase was made, by and large, with funds from those loyal patrons whose monthly support through Patreon helps support video production, and in this case, video production equipment. So a special shout out to all you guys there at Patreon. And if any viewers like this sort of content and are interested in becoming a patron, there's a link to Patreon in the video description, no surprise, where you can sign up if that's something you're motivated to do. But with all the hot air I'm blowing out here, I'm sure that mud is dry, so I'm gonna get that sanded to wrap up the video. Well, the mud on that patch has indeed dried. It's bone dry there and ready to sand, but so that I don't fool myself or viewers, I'm gonna shut off the lights in the shop and use a glancing light to show what this coat of the patch actually looks like. And what you see is that this side of the patch is pretty decent. Still got some work to do on the other side over there. There's a hump from the tape or a hump from the edge of the panel. There's still a divot down there where there was an infill. But even though there's still some contour in the patch, it's ready to be sanded to clean it up before applying another skim coat. And I don't know if you noticed uh, while I had the lights off that this glancing light even shows up brush and roller strokes in the paint itself. So you know how critical this light is. And something that shows up at all here will basically never show up under normal lighting conditions. But it's a good way to gauge the progress of the patch and kind of highlight the benefit of making the patch this way because this hump over here looks like a mountain, but there's barely anything there. And you can see the progress of it after I sand this and apply another coat. And specifically on patchwork, I like to use a glancing light the whole time I'm sanding so that I can concentrate on areas that need more sanding and skip over areas that don't need as much. And by sanding this coat to the point that paper just shows through, I make sure that I'm using enough mud to cover the patch, but I'm keeping any humping of the patch to a minimum because I know I've sanded down as far as I can before damaging the patch. And in an area like this, even though the patch is smooth and there's no more visible lines, I keep sanding till I get down near the paper so that I know there's not an excess hump in that taping mud. And that, my friends, is looking mighty fine and is ready for a final thin skim coat to cover those exposed paper spots before a final sanding that makes it ready for primer and paint. It's difficult to get a good camera angle and adequate lighting to show, but when I use a straight edge on the patch, I hope you can see how flat this repair is, especially when compared to using the normal patch and tape process. I get a little rocking with the straight edge, but there's barely a sixteenth of an inch hump in the repair at this stage, which is more than acceptable and will never show when the wall has its finished coat of paint. I used a little water to thin down the mud for this last skim coat. I don't really want to build anything. I just want a nice, easy, thin layer that'll sand smooth. And I'm doing a thorough skim just because I'm showing off a little bit for the video, when in fact those little spots of paper would probably cover just fine with some primer. But I think I can call it good at that. The good news is, the thinner the patch, the faster it dries. So in no time at all, this is ready for a final sanding with 120 grit sandpaper to make it ready for primer and paint. And there's a lot less contour in this patch at this stage because the multiple coats help level everything out. So very little sanding is required just to remove the irregularities in the surface because I'm not really sanding for flatness. And the most important thing for this final sand is to make sure that all the edges are feathered out so there's no ridges left in the surface that would show up through primer and paint. And that right there is as good as it gets, which looks excellent now and will only look better after it's painted. And here's one final shot of the completed patch with a straight edge where you can see that variation is at a bare minimum in the range of about a sixteenth of an inch. 
Well, I got to say that I'm glad to have that patch taken care of so when it comes time to uh, actually do a facelift on the inside of the shop with a new coat of paint, that's one less area I've got to deal with at that time. And I hope it gives you an idea of what's possible when it comes to patching drywall without tape. And I can get back to other pressing projects here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop. And thank you, as always, and until next time, thanks for watching. Well, you certainly are determined if you're still here at the end of the end of the end after watching that long and potentially very boring video. So I'll just throw in a little tidbit here as I'm cleaning up. And I don't know if anybody else experiences this, but uh, partially using a bucket of mud can kind of render the whole rest of the batch useless, which is a shame because I've only used a third of this bucket for this patch. So. For hygiene on this sort of thing, I try to work the mud down till it's fairly flat, not a lot of jaggedy stuff sticking up in there, which is a little tricky to do. But it is possible, and once I've got that settled down like that, uh, this, is, this is still pretty liquid on top. Sometimes if the bu uh, bucket gets left open, it gets dry and crusty, and all those little chunks will Re, um, re soak and then just become part of the mud again. But before I close the bucket, I take a spritz of water, kind of coat the top of it, and that'll just permeate down into the mud. And then the most important tip is giving it a shot of denatured alcohol. That's a pretty big shot. Normally I don't use that much. This nozzle was set, yeah, should be a mist and not a stream. But, anyways, a mist of alcohol. On the top of that, that just um, seems to kill any bacteria that want to grow in there. If you've ever opened up a bucket of mud after it's been stored on a shelf for a while, it's generally pretty chunky, pretty crusty, and often quite moldy and stinky. But doing that little bit of hygiene there really uh, helps extend the shelf life of a partial bucket of mud. So I'm going to leave that at that. and. Thank all you persistent viewers for sticking around for the end of the end of the end of the end here at Next Level Carpentry.